I'd like to welcome you to this course in which we discuss the history of early Christianity from Jesus to Constantine. As we'll see early on, our topic, is, our topic is one of the most important subjects for anyone interested in religion, Western civilization, the history of the Western world. At the same time, this is a widely neglected area, little known or understood among otherwise highly educated people. Many people have vague ideas about early Christian history, some notion that Christians were a small, persecuted minority hiding out in catacombs to avoid arrest, but a group that grew rapidly because of their fervent convictions and willingness to die for their faith. In this course, we'll be examining the real history of the early Christian movement, exploding some of the common myths about it, while highlighting just how important this history was for us today. The fact is that whether we ourselves are Christian or not, this history of early Christianity has had a profound impact on our form of civilization, our social world, our beliefs, values, assumptions, worldviews, all of which would be radically different if things had turned out differently. And so I'd like to begin with a very brief statement of why the history of early Christianity is such an important topic, and then spend the rest of this particular lecture indicating different aspects of the topic that we'll be covering during the course of lectures. As I hope you'll see, these matters are not only important, they are fascinating as well, yet they are little known outside of the world of scholarship. First, the importance of the topic. Christianity is, without a doubt, the most significant religious movement in the history of Western civilization. Throughout the history of the West, the most important institution of any kind, not just religiously, but also politically, economically, socially, and culturally, has been the Christian Church, from late antiquity, to the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance, to the Reformation and on into modern times. None of these historical moments would have been anything like the same had Christianity not been the dominant religion of the West. Not the fall of the Roman Empire, or the Middle Ages, or the European Renaissance, or the Reformation, or the movement into the modern world. Without Christianity, what would our world have looked like in all of these periods? What would have happened, and how would we all be different today? Despite the central importance of other great religious traditions in our world, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity remains the largest religion in the world with some two billion adherents today. And yet, it was not always that way. Christianity, in fact, began as a small and inauspicious sect within Judaism. Its earliest adherents were a tiny group of uneducated and illiterate peasants in a remote and unsavory corner of the Roman Empire who followed a virtually unknown teacher who was executed for treason against the state. The basic question that we'll be dealing with in this course is how we got from one to the other. How Christianity could have had such a stunning impact on our world after having such an unpromising beginning. We will not cover the entirety of the Christian religion in this set of lectures, but only its first three centuries, the highly formative years from the time of Jesus of Nazareth in the first century AD to the time of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the early fourth century. To begin, I should say a word about these two historic figures who provide the nodal points for our discussion, Jesus at the beginning and Constantine at the end. Jesus of Nazareth was, of course, the founder and the foundation of the Christian religion. Briefly, uh, I can give something of his life here. We're going to 
spend an entire lecture on the life of Jesus, but briefly, to set the context for our reflections in this lecture, Jesus was born around the year 4 B.C. That uh, seems a little bit odd that Jesus would be born four years before Christ, but in fact that is, uh, that, that is probably when he was born. The person who came up with our calendars in the Middle Ages, uh, a monk named Dionysius Exiguus, uh, was uh, a bit confused about some of the dates of Roman history, and he had uh, King Herod dying in, the, in what would now be 4 B.C. So when he came up with our calendar, if Jesus was actually born during the reign of King Herod, then Jesus was born four years before Christ. Well, that's, that's how people uh, today generally think about things, that Jesus was born around 4 B.C. He lived until around the year 30 A.D., his public ministry, if it lasted for three years, then would have lasted between 27 and 30 A.D. His ministry consisted of uh, a proclamation that he made of a coming kingdom of God. Jesus was a Jewish prophet proclaiming a coming kingdom to people in rural uh, areas in Galilee and then in Judea, in, in Israel. He was reputed to be a uh, miracle worker and an exorcist. At the end of his life, he went to Jerusalem in order to make his proclamation there, and there in Jerusalem he was arrested, put on trial, and crucified for claiming to be the king of the coming kingdom that he proclaimed. After Jesus' day, Christianity moved by fits and starts throughout the Roman Empire, usually quite slowly, but steadily. The disciples of Jesus came to believe that after his crucifixion, God had vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. They believed he really was the king of this coming kingdom, and so they called him the Messiah. The Messiah, in a new sense, the king of Israel, the king, in fact, of the world, the Messiah, who had died for the sins of the world. For centuries, these followers of Jesus continued to be a small, unfavored, and even persecuted splinter group from Judaism. But they steadily expanded over the years as they converted other people to come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, converted principally Gentiles to this faith. Gentiles, non-Jews, were the principal converts of these Christians over the years, especially after the beginning of Christianity in the early first century. Constantine, looking at the other end of our time period, was the first Roman emperor to convert to become a follower of Jesus. Once the emperor of Rome converted to Christianity, that changed everything. Prior to Constantine's conversion, the Christian church had grown slowly from being a mere handful of Jesus followers to becoming something like five, maybe seven percent of the Roman Empire by the beginning of the fourth century. Constantine's conversion is usually dated to around the year 312 AD. Once that conversion happened, the Christian religion took off in a big, a major way, so that by the end of the fourth century, it could claim something like half of the empire's entire population. And in fact, by the end of the 4th century, Christianity was declared to be the empire's official religion. And so we have the inauspicious beginnings with Jesus and his followers in a remote part of the empire by, uh, in the 1st century, beginning of the 1st century. By the 4th century, we have a major world religion that's destined to become then the official religion of the Roman Empire. We are interested in this course in the intervening years. What happened? in the years between Jesus and Constantine. How did the religion start? How did it relate to its mother religion, Judaism? How did it grow? How was it received by the masses? How was it received by imperial authorities? Why was it persecuted? And how did it develop and change internally so that the re religion that Constantine converted to, in fact, was different from the religion that Jesus started. Well, how is it different, and how did it move from point A to point B? These are the questions we'll be addressing in this course. For the rest of this uh, particular lecture, I'd like to lay out in a bit more detail some of the, uh, the nature of some of the issues that we'll be addressing. Issue number one. 
Most people who converted to Christianity in the first three centuries, as I've pointed out, were Gentiles, non-Jews, which means that in terms of religion, they were pagans. Now, I should uh, clarify uh, this term, since I'll be using it throughout the course. When I use the term pagan in this course, I'm not using it in a derogatory way, the way uh, we might use it today when I'm referring to my next-door neighbor who's a real pagan uh, because he throws his Budweiser cans out into the yard and doesn't mow his lawn and such. It's not a derogatory term when used by historians to refer to the ancient world. The word pagan simply refers to anybody who uh, was a, uh, uh, an adherent of any of the polytheistic religions throughout the empire. So pagan simply refers to a polytheist, one who worshipped the many gods, many of the gods. Most of the people who converted to Christianity were pagans over the three centuries that we'll be looking at, polytheists adhering to various religions of the, uh, of the Roman Empire. So, to begin the course, this is our first issue, we need to begin by seeing what these religions were like, these polytheistic religions adhered to by the vast majority of adherents in the ancient world. We have to consider what kinds of gods these people worshipped, why they worshipped them, and how they went about doing so. We'll see that polytheists in the ancient world thought, of course, that their understanding of religion was correct. Today, people think of monotheism as the one option, and so people ask one another, might ask somebody, do you believe in God? Well, in the ancient Roman world, that sort of question wasn't asked, both because uh, belief itself wasn't that big of an issue, as odd as this may seem to us today. Belief in God wasn't that much of an issue. It was taken for granted but also because most pagans, virtually all pagans, believe not just in sort of one superior god, but they believed in lots of gods. These lots of gods had all kinds of functions in people's lives, and they resided in all sorts of places. There were great gods who were uh, in charge of the state, the, uh, the empire. There were lower gods below them. There were sort of in less significant gods, much closer to us, gods for all kinds of places and all kinds of functions. We need to consider what this religious environment was all about, and we need to look at points of contact between the Christian's belief in the one true God who created all things and who was sovereign over all things, and the pagans' beliefs in many gods who influenced every aspect of life. What are the connections between what the Christians were saying about their God and Jesus as his son and what pagans were saying about the multiplicity of gods? I'll be arguing that, in fact, there are connections between these two, two, kinds, uh, these two kinds of religion, that Christianity would not have succeeded if it hadn't been able to show that there are connections between its understanding of the uh, divine realm and the pagan understanding of the divine realm. If Christianity was preaching something completely different from what pagans were saying, it wouldn't have made sense to anybody. And so we need to consider what these points of contact were. That's issue one. Issue two. At the same time, Christianity started out as a sect within Judaism. Jesus was a Jewish teacher. His followers were Jewish peasants. And so, we need to consider what Judaism was like in the ancient world, how it was like and unlike the pagan religions that were predominant at the time. For in fact, Judaism was quite different from anything else in the world. There were lots of religions uh, throughout the empire that were all, all of these religions were polytheist, except Judaism, which was monotheist, believing that there's only one God who deserves to be worshipped, and Jews maintained that this one God was their God, who had called them, the children of Israel, to be his people. They maintained that God had made a covenant with them, had given them his law that they were to follow since they were his people. Christianity started out as a sect of Judaism because Jesus and his followers were Jewish, and so in order to understand the development of Christianity, we need to understand something more about the Jewish religion. That'll be our second issue. Issue number three. After reflecting on the religious milieu of Jesus and his earliest followers, we will begin to examine the beginnings of Christianity itself. We will start, naturally enough, with the historical Jesus. And we'll begin by seeing why it is so difficult for historians today to know what Jesus himself actually said and did. 
This may be uh, counterintuitive to many people today that it's hard to know much about Jesus. It, it may seem counterintuitive because it seems that everybody uh, knows everything about Jesus. Uh, turn on the TV any Sunday morning and you'll find all sorts of people who seem to know a lot about Jesus. Well, how do they know what they know? How do we know what we know? As it turns out, scholars have recognized that, in fact, it's difficult to know about what Jesus himself actually said and did, the difficulty residing in the nature of our sources. As it turns out, we don't have very many or very good sources for knowing about the historical Jesus. We have very few sources outside of the New Testament, and the sources within the New Testament don't say very much about the historical Jesus except for the four Gospels. We have four Gospels in the New Testament, and those books themselves are somewhat problematic for engaging in historical research about Jesus. They're not, I'm not saying that they're problematic for uh, people who are themselves Christian, who read these books for, for their uh, theological insights, for their uh, belief in Jesus, but for historians, these books can be problematic, as we will see in a later lecture. And so our third issue will be dealing with the very beginnings of Christianity with Jesus himself. Fourth issue, we will then move to consider how the religion that Jesus himself proclaimed turned into the religion about Jesus. How the religion that Jesus proclaimed turned into the religion about Jesus. For Christianity, in fact, is much more than the proclamation of the historical Jesus himself. Christianity is a religion that's rooted in a belief in Jesus' death and resurrection for the salvation of the world. How did we get from one to the other? How did we get from the religion of Jesus to the religion about Jesus? In this section of the course, we will be focusing attention especially on the Apostle Paul to see how he helped to transform Jesus' message into a religion based on Jesus' own death and resurrection. The Apostle Paul is a very important figure for the beginning of Christianity. He started out originally as an opponent of, of uh, Jesus' followers, but then he converted and began to proclaim Jesus' message. We have several writings by the Apostle Paul within the New Testament, which can help us understand his proclamation of Jesus. That then will be issue four, how the religion of Jesus became religion about Jesus. Issue five, once Christianity became a new religion, separate from Judaism, there's obviously the question of how Christians related to Jews in these earliest centuries. A fascinating topic of early Jewish-Christian relations. Our next section of the course then will consider this historically significant issue of how Christianity started out as a sect within Judaism and yet became a virulently anti-Jewish religion, all within the course of just over a century. How Christianity moved from being a sect within Judaism to becoming strongly anti-Jewish. The earliest Christians were themselves Jews who worshipped the Jewish God and read the Jewish scriptures and understood Jesus to be the Jewish Messiah send in fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies to the Jewish people. How did Christianity move from being that kind of religion to a religion that condemned Jews for being Christ killers within a hundred years? That'll be the fifth issue that we'll be looking at in this course of lectures. Issue six. Christians, of course, had to relate not just to Jews and to Judaism, but to the larger Roman world. In the next section of the course, we will then consider issues involving the relationship of Christianity and empire. We'll begin that section of the course by asking how Christianity managed to win converts in the empire from among pagans. It's actually a fairly interesting question that many people haven't thought very much about. If Christians are converting Jews to believe in Jesus, then it's not that complicated conceptually. These are people who believe in the one God of the Jews, and uh, Christians are trying to convince them that Jesus is the son of that God, that Jesus is the Messiah of that God. Uh, the assumption is that everybody agrees that there's one God, that he gave the Jewish law, made the Jewish covenant. Uh, what Christians are saying is that Christ is the fulfillment of that covenant, of that law. Conceptually, that's not difficult. 
But what about when Christians are trying to convert pagans? Pagans don't believe in the one Jewish God. So, for Christians to convert a pagan to Christianity, first they have to convert them to an understanding of the one true God, the Jewish God. But this is involved because the Christians, in fact, do not portray themselves as Jews. And so they're trying to convince people to believe in the Jewish God, and yet they're not trying to convince them to become Jewish. This ended up being a rather tricky affair. And so we'll need to consider how this actually worked. How did it happen? How did Christians convert pagans to worship the Jewish God? What did they say to them to convince them? And what did they say to convince them that Jesus was the son of this Jewish God who died for the sins of the world? What, what could they possibly say to somebody who was a polytheist to con convince them? The reason it's a pressing question is because the Christians were, were remarkably successful at this. But how did they go about doing it? That's one of the issues we'll be looking at uh, in, in this course of lectures. What Christians preached that proved convincing to others, so that they not only started worshiping the Jewish God, but they gave up worshiping their old gods. They gave up being pagans to become Christians, worshiping the Jewish God, yet without themselves being Jewish. What missionary strategies did these Christians use? Did they have revival meetings? Uh, did they preach in large theaters and uh, have masses come forward? Did they have massive conversions? Did they engage in door-to-door -door evangelism? What, what did they do in order to convince others? This leads then naturally to issue seven. How was Christianity received by those who uh, were uh, the, uh, the, objects of the, the subjects of the proclamation? How was Christianity received? by both Jews and pagans. As we'll see, there were, of course, some people who accepted the religion. One of the things that we'll, we'll observe is that uh, Christianity, in fact, did not, uh, does not appear to have had massive conversions. It appears that people converted uh, one at a time, often by uh, simply uh, by word of mouth, that somebody converted their, uh, their spouse, who converted the next door neighbor, who converted their spouse, who converted their children, who converted, and they went, went kind of by word of mouth rather than massive uh, campaigns. Well, how was Christianity uh, received? Sometimes it was accepted. A lot of the time, Christianity was simply ignored by people in the Roman Empire. But on other occasions, Christianity was opposed. And so this is our seventh issue. How was Christianity opposed within the empire? In this section of the course, we'll be considering the intriguing historical questions about Christian persecution. We'll look at when, where, and how Christians were persecuted by non-Christian masses and by imperial authorities, sometimes to the point of death. We'll see that it's not at all the case that Christianity was the illegal religion in the empire. People have this idea that Christianity was illegal so that you were breaking the law to become a Christian. In fact, that's not true. Christianity was not illegal. There were no, there was no legislation against Christianity, and there were no empire-wide persecutions of Christians for 200 years. The first time any emperor condemned Christianity and tried to force everybody in the empire to stop being a Christian, the first time that happened uh, wasn't until the year 249. In other words, 200 years, over 200 years after Jesus. Before that, Christianity wasn't considered to be illegal, but it was sometimes persecuted. Well, why would Christians be put on trial and sometimes be put to death if their religion was not illegal? Well, that's a very interesting question. It's an interesting historical question. That's one of the things that we'll be, we'll be trying to understand uh, at that point uh, in, our, in our course. That is our issue number seven, the persecution of Christians. Issue number eight. While Christianity was spreading and interacting with both Jews and pagans, of course, it was also developing internally, changing within itself, so that the religion uh, by the 4th century was quite different from the religion of the 1st century. Some of the most intriguing aspects of early Christianity involve its wi widely diverse character, as different people claiming to be Christian adhered to all sorts of beliefs and practices, asserting that their views were true, but the views of other Christians were false. Christianity became a uh, highly 
diverse uh, religion. And I want to show in this course of lectures, at near, nearer the end of it, why it became such a diverse religion. Some scholars have begun to talk not about ancient Christianity, but about ancient Christianities. It was so diverse. Well, we want to consider some of the internal battles, especially the internal battles that focused on issues of orthodoxy and heresy. Orthodoxy meaning correct belief. That's the technical, the, uh, technical meaning of orthodoxy. It comes from two Greek words which mean correct belief. And heresy, which uh, come from, uh, the word heresy comes from a Greek word which means choice. And so a heretic is somebody who chooses not to believe the right beliefs. Well, within early Christianity, we have issues of orthodoxy and heresy as Christians battled out over what point of view was correct, what beliefs were correct. And we'll see there was a remarkable diversity among Christians, many Christians holding points of view that today nobody would say was Christian. But in the early centuries, there were people who called themselves Christian, who said they were followers of Jesus, who said that they were adhering to the, uh, the writings of the apostles, who said, for example, that there's not one God, there's two gods. Some people called themselves Christian, said there are 30 gods. We have some Christians on record claiming that there are 365 gods. These are Christians. They call themselves Christians. They say they follow Jesus. Well, how could that possibly be? Well, because, in fact, early Christianity was quite diverse, and Christianity had internal battles to decide which set of beliefs was correct, which set of beliefs were heretical. The heretical beliefs got wiped out, so that today the kind of Christianity we've inherited is one form that came down to us from these early, early decades, these early centuries. In this context, we will look not only at what different people believed among the Christians, but we'll also see that they each had different written authorities for their views. Every group of Christians, even the ones who said there are 365 gods, had books that supported their point of view, and these books all claimed to be written by the apostles of Jesus, which means a number of these books, probably most of these books, were in fact forged. We'll consider forgeries. Many, many of these forgeries have turned up in modern times, by archaeologists and sometimes simply by accident, and we'll look at some of these, these early forgeries in the names of the apostles. It was out of this set of conflicts over what to believe and which books to read that the New Testament as a collection of authoritative books emerged. Well, how did we get, how did we get these books, these 27 books? Why don't we have other books? As it turns out, there are other Gospels. Why didn't the other Gospels make it into the New Testament instead of just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We'll be considering all of those uh, issues at a later point in the, in the course. Finally, issue 9. We will conclude the course by considering the formation of early Christianity to become the kind of religion that people are familiar with today. This religion that people are familiar with today includes a canon of Scripture, 27 books, that uh, you can buy in any used bookstore today. It included not only a canon of scripture, it included a creed that uh, people still confess today that exp expresses the correct theological beliefs, such as the belief in the Trinity. We'll be seeing how this belief in the Trinity and the other early Christian uh, beliefs became crystallized by the fourth century. Christianity today involves practices of worship that include such things as the practice of baptism, the, uh, the taking of the Eucharist. Christianity today involves a church structure that includes clerical offices, such as priests and bishops. Eventually, Christianity ended up with a pope in one form of Christianity. Christianity did not always have these things, the canon, the creed, the, uh, the clergy, the Eucharist, the baptism, etc. Well, how did they get these things? We'll be considering all of that. In a final wrap-up lecture, uh, the final lecture for the course, we'll be considering the internal and external success of Christianity as it developed over its first 300 years. To become a religion that would eventually convert and then dominate the religious, political, social, cultural world of the Roman Empire, and so be transmitted down to us today as the most important institution in the history of our form of civilization. As we move through this course of lectures, I hope that you'll agree with me that the first, 300, the first three centuries of Christianity are critical for anyone, 
not just those who are Christians, but anyone who is interested in understanding the history of Western civilization, our own world, and ourselves.